comes, even to kings, the time of great weariness. Then the gold of the throne is brass, the silk of the palace becomes drab. The gems and the diadem sparkle drearily like the eyes of the white seas. The speech of men is as the empty rattle of a jester's bell, and the feel comes of things unreal. Even the sun is copper in the sky, and the breath of the green ocean is no longer fresh. What hides behind the mirror, dear viewers? Welcome to another episode of Roll of Attention, where XJ, Robert Gibson and I discuss works from all across the literature world. Tonight, we revisit the works of Robert E. Howard in his short story, The Mirrors of Tuzanthum, starring the one and only Cool of Atlantis. This work dives deep into existential questions of reality. The king of Illusia becomes beset by a terrible boredom, a mood of apprehension and disdain for his current life. One of his court women suggests to Cole that he should visit a great mage of the land, he of the Elder Race, who holds answers of the universe, most daring questions. When our hero meets the titular character, Tuzan Thul deflects most questions posed to him by the king. Does he hold magic? But of course, else how could he move the flesh bound to his body? Can he summon demons? Indeed, with a simple fist to Cole's face, the wizard claims to create all kinds of hallucinations. Can he speak with the other side? Hmm. All humans are dead men walking as soon as they draw breath. So the wizard speaks only to the deceased. An old man, the Magus. Surely he lives forever. All beings live until their time comes, the wizard answers. Cool spends most of the tale mesmerized within the house of a thousand mirrors, as Thun guides the king into hypnotically induced contemplations. The majority of the tale spends its runtime on questions that begin to play cool as he stares into the halls of mirrors supposedly crafted by deep magic. And while at first he sees other worlds, then comes his own reflection, and he gazes into the reflective surfaces. Something about the, this image implies to the last Atlantan that the world existing within the mirrors is real, and perhaps even more real than his current existence. The land falls into disarray, a school visits the mage daily, continuously stuck in irresistible cogitations. On a fateful day, when Cool is moments away from joining the mirror worlds, the king is saved by his most trusted advisor, Brul of Pictland, who shatters the mirror and kills the wizard before he can finish his work. Nevertheless, it seems Cool will be haunted by what he has learned in the House of a Thousand Mirrors, now a decrepit and abandoned house by the Lake of Visions that none will enter. For the hours spent in profound meditations in the mirrors of Tuzan Thun are not easily forgotten. That is the tale that we have read. It is quite a short one. It was published in uh, September 1929 within the famed magazine Weird Tales from which we have drawn a lot of stories as of late. And its proposed questions, its musings, are quite interesting. And I hope that tonight we will dive a little bit deeper into the meanings that Robert E. Howard was trying to show to his readers. And also, what exactly was Cool doing? Was he really going some other places, or was this just magic that mesmerized him. But before we answer these questions, let's just see initial thoughts from the other colleagues at the panel. Uh, actually, why don't you start? What did you think of the mirrors of Tuzan Thul? Um, I thought the, I thought the style of writing is, was very, is very interesting. It's uh, quite different from how it's a uh, usual style, which is more, uh, 
uh, for lack of better words, I'll call it straightforward prose. But the style of Kuzun Tun felt a little bit more like a cant. Um, it. I imagine if we were reading the epic of Gilgamesh, it would start something like that. Uh, it's very Homeric. It's like it feels like in the year of something, 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 uh, king, blah, 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 sat on his throne and gazed out into the, I don't know, something like that. It, it did feel very much like that. And uh, it's always, um, it's always, uh, uh, I want to use the word daunting uh, to see, to, to try a new, uh, to try to write in a style that you have not written in before. And mm-hmm. it's also yeah, sure. very uh, amazing to actually see it succeed. So hats off to Robert E. Howard for being able to write in different styles. I, I concur with oh yeah go on. no style switching is very very hard to do correct yes i concur with you with the idea of this tale feeling like it is a myth uh, a mythology tale uh, that is uh, spreading before us um what what elements did you feel um uh, apply to that was it just the introduction um you know was it uh, the way the prose was uh, written itself or some elements that made you feel of uh, mythology yeah it's mostly the uh, the style in which it's written um i can't quite put a finger to it i'm i i'm not a student of uh, styles of writing so uh, but it's very obvious when you see it um for the uh, the topics themselves, uh, there it's all right, I suppose. Um, it is the so it is the first. This is the first cow the conqueror. Uh, sorry, I've read. So I don't know yeah. what kind of uh, what kind of. S- what uh what kind of what flavors the other stories are um if it it yeah mm-hmm. it it sounds like it so it feel just from this story it felt a little bit like uh cow cow stories are aiming for a little bit like um meditations if you've if you have read that by Marcus Aurelius, ah yes, the Stoicism. Of yeah, course. so so it um, has it has more to do with uh, uh, leadership and and inner like um, inner thought process. The it feels more like uh, a sort of. Uh, a sort of uh, the sort of like a journal that that a king might have on how he should he should have led his people how he should have ruled but that's that usually only comes from uh, rulers that actually cared about uh, ruling their kingdom of which I'm not sure if Kao actually is like that <laughs> yeah I think I think it um, it's an interesting proposition to start your story with the character's motivation being I'm bored, right? It's a very daring start for a tale. And Cool is seldom bored in his other tales. Uh, Mm. For example, this is the second tale that was ever published about him. And the first one, The Shadow Kingdom, uh, it is arguably the first source, like proper swords and sorcery. Um, type of a tale, right? It's it really is the grandfather of that genre, and uh, cool. If you if you look at the way uh, he was published in the Weird Tales, you could also call him the grandfather of Conan, mm. uh, because Conan was modeled after Cool in in a lot of ways. They're different, 
um, you know, um, at least in the style of their personalities and their desires. For example, Cool is very asexual. You see that at the beginning of the tale where he sort of looks at uh, the woman and her beauty, but he's just like, yeah, whatever. I don't care. Well, uh, I'm just so, going to enjoy so, the so two, throne. So, so, two th so two things. One, there are only two stories of Cool. No, no, there are more than okay. two. Well, I mean, it, it, as for the asexual part, I suppose it kind of depends on... Oh, look, that's quite a bit. Um, I yeah. suppose it kind of depends on uh, how big his, his uh, haram is. <laughs> well, he's never really described in any of his tales being interested in the other sex. Hmm. Uh, sometimes the other sex is described by Howard for the viewer, but Cool does not care one iota. He's not like Conan, who is basically a dog, you know. Whenever he sees Fair a beautiful enough. woman, he's like, oh, yes. Fair enough. This, this is what I want. Fair enough. And uh, back to another point that you made, which uh, you know I'll then pass on to to Robert and his initial thoughts. Um, the the idea of uh, cool being a good or a bad ruler single handedly uh, rests by I think the story that um, we are reading and quite specifically the time of his rule, uh, because so the you know the backstory of cool. For those of you who don't know, is he was part of Atlantis, this uh, mythical land, and uh, most of his stories, if not all of them, um, if I'm not uh, mistaken, uh, take after the time of uh, Atlantis's uh, downfall, or at least Cool's exile from there, and his whole personality is based on this person without a home who has made. Um, a place of his own. He has taken over this kingdom as a barbarian king, and at first he he does protect it. He does make it um, his own, so to speak. Um, not to reiterate myself again, but he is the ruler who we see progress throughout the tale. We see his rise, his downfall, his meandering, and the mirror of Thuzan Thul. Uh, kind of sits in the middle. It's like in the middle period of between Cole's rise to power and him uh, getting the grips of rule, coming closer to the end of the golden age, as, as you say. Even, um, you know, even the other stories, um, at least the ones that I've read, um, he, he, much, um, he is much more caring about what's going on in the kingdom. It, it is an interesting starting point. Uh, Irregardless, but yes, um, Robert, you you know you have been silent for a little bit. I'm I apologize. It took so long to get to you. What what is your um, collection of thoughts regarding this tale, at least initially? Yeah. It's it's quite a remarkable refutation of the criticisms that, that some people have leveled against Howard's writing that all his heroes are cut from the same cloth. In fact, as you just said. Cull and Conan are very different. It's not just that Conan's into wenching and Cull isn't. It's also that Cull is very much more reflective and moody. Well, Conan can be fairly moody, but... Uh, <laughs> in a different way, you know, in his drunken way, stupor yeah. when he's throwing flaggers at people, then he's moody. Quite, quite. Um, yes, Cull, Cull is, is quite by nature, reflective. Um, and he's also um, a lonelier figure. You can't, you can't sort of say about Conan, oh, poor chap, he's lonely. But you can, you can say that about uh, Cull. Um, I suppose both of them might be a prey to boredom in some circumstances. But uh, one feels that it's likely to afflict Cull more than... Uh, more than Conan. Um, I mean, Cole has everything he wants whenever we are uh, with him, right? He's a king. Mm. He has done his part. 
Uh, he's a ruler. Conan, as I've described him before, is a dog in many ways. You know, he's looking mm -hmm. for scraps. He needs gold. He requires adventure because otherwise his flagon will be empty and his belly will uh, turn into an acid pit, right? He has to go and fight for the bread. Um, mm -hmm. So, and Cool is much more like, oh yeah, so I'm the king. What's going on here? Oh, I'm bored. <laughs> you know, so, that's kind of where we start. With so, it. so I have a question for you. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you give like a gist of the flavor of uh, the other cool stories? Because um, um, it sounds like from the way you're describing it, cool is not doing much. Well, in this... Um... He does. He, he is a sword and sorcery um, character, right? So in in the so for example in the Shadow Kingdom he he fights a a big foe uh, that has come to his kingdom. Uh, the word kingdom is used a lot in that tale, just like in that sentence. And uh, he he does actively participate in. There's also a story where he's a soldier. Uh, part of the Volusia Guard. Uh, there are there are tales where he is a pirate, where he is an outlaw and a gladiator. But every time when you meet Cull, he has the sense of authority. Even when he's a even when he's a pirate, even when he's a gladiator, he always acts with this "I am better than you." And sometimes it comes from the fact that he's Atlantean. That he has these super genes, uh, basically, and sometimes it comes from his position, like in this story. Uh, Conan, uh, in comparison, you know, is a person who who tries to hold authority over people, but they dismiss him. They call him a barbarian. They don't see him as someone to respect. While Cole gets respect, and uh, he, you know, he revels in uh, in his power. Hmm. That is very interesting. That is not at all the direction I thought the stories would go just based on the mirrors of Tuzum Tomb. Hmm. And also one consequence of uh, what uh, Nikki just said about the, the authority is that a lot of the plots of Cole's stories are to do with him facing conspiracies, if I remember correctly, whereas Conan, well, own right at the end of his career he does get into the position where people are conspiring against him but uh, mostly he's the one he's more likely to be the one doing the conspiring himself uh, whereas Cole he's sitting on his throne and the author has to invent reasons why uh, he, he create, gets up from the throne yeah create problems create problems for him. yeah and it's I mean, you also have to understand the publishing history of Cool in order to understand him as a character. The there are many more stories about Cool than they were actually published, and they were later re-released after Howard's death. Uh, so there were only three um, stories that that were published, all in weird tales: the Shadow Kingdom, the Mirrors uh, of Thun uh, that we just uh, read, and Kings of the Night. The rest of them, the altar and the scorpion, the black city, the curse of the golden skull, um, exile of Atlantis, and, and so on and so forth, all of them were published after Howard's death. Hmm. And they, they, some of them lack the polish of Howard's finished works, and you can't really put that on Howard because he never got to finish them in a way where they could be published, right? Uh, but at the same time, they also have this enigmatic feel, right? And it's it's almost like when when people found out that there were more cool stories, um, I distinctly remember reading uh, about this, you know, absolute explosion. Because yes, people knew about Conan, then they loved Conan, and Conan is the most um, the most famous uh, character created by Howard. But when people figured out that there was more of cool for a brief moment, you know, there was this craze, right? Oh, you know, are we going to find out about Atlantis? What's going, what's going to happen? You know, because 
another part of this whole thing is Cool's world is Conan's world, just earlier. So Cool lives before the time of Conan. And you get to see the um, you know, some of the imperfections of the world uh, surface in this story because the story spends some time in talking about how no one will remember you. No mm. one will uh, see your tribe and your kingdom in the future. You may be forgotten. So live now and not mm. tomorrow or yesterday. And mm. I think that's, you know, I, I really want to discuss this point about the story, right? What do you guys think of the message uh, about living in today and not worrying about tomorrow or yesterday? Do you find that it is still, um, you know, it's still applicable to the life that we are currently leading. Yeah, but there's two ways it can be taken. There's the uh, fatalistic way in which you say, well, just live for today because nothing you achieve was going to survive anyway and your own life is going to be forgotten. So what the heck, uh, it's, it's futile to try for anything permanent. And the other way is the the more Christian way, which is to say, well, um, the reason why you don't have to take thought for the morrow is that everything is being inscribed, as it were, in uh, in uh, like a, a recording needle, you know, in the days with vinyl records. Uh, everything everything is actually eternally existing anyway, so nothing is lost. So either you can say, well, everything is lost or nothing is lost. But and if nothing is lost, then nothing is ever gained. Oh, I don't know. I, could, I'm not sure. Why, about how could that. you create, if, some, if everything exists for eternity, yeah. there is no gain. It has already existed. So any of your accomplishments uh, have already happened, right? Well, so are mm. they really accomplishments then? Well, there is such a thing as the arrow of time and yes. and you know it's it's simply that eternity goes into a different dimension and looks down on the arrow as it creeps forward if you see what i mean i have a third way of of, of looking at this uh, metaphor i think that it's all about abandoning the fear of what will come tomorrow and if the shadows of the past will be looming over you I think it's a it's not fatalistic and I don't think it's religious. I think it's actually the most human message one could give to anybody. The best advice a father could give to his son. Don't worry about what will happen. Do what you think is right. Do what you want because tomorrow may not happen and yesterday already did. Yeah. <clears throat> of course uh, the the point of this story though is mm. that the, wiz the wizard says things which might or might not be wise, but he says them in such an evasive way that it's quite sinister in a way. It's yes. like uh, it's very cleverly done. This story is very cleverly written, and I hadn't really appreciated it a couple of times I'd read it before, but it's something you wouldn't expect Howard to do in my opinion anyway he very very cleverly um pro propounds this ambiguous philosophy and you can see how king cull gets trapped by it it so i say it's a very impressive performance that's right and i think uh, a wizard is much more impressive where he doesn't actually have any mystical powers uh, but is able to mesmerize you simply by proposing to you questions and answers that are so mind-boggling, you kind of have to sit down and think about it, staring at the mirror, mm. right? The, the contemplation he creates. And I also think that we, we kind of have to, at least that's the way I was thinking about it uh, in the tale, you have to think about the world that these mirrors are existing. I propose that these are perfect mirrors, that these are modern-day mirrors. They're like perfect reflections. 
not the mirrors that used to exist in the in the old days you know the polished brass or copper from the side like perfect reflections and that's what stuns Cole because he is uh, encountered by something that you know, we see normally, you know, we see our reflection in these video screens currently, uh, the uh, video feed from Discord. It's a pitch perfect uh, picture of me. I mean, I'm a bit more handsome in real life, but, uh, you know, it's 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 95 percent correct. And um, I feel like people in Cool's world don't get to see such mirrors. And so the mysticism mm -hmm. is added there. It's not said in the story because how could Howard say it without breaking mm -hmm. the immersion of the reader? But that I really got that feeling that this is because you know Cole is stunned by the fact that this is a perfect image. He's like, "Whoa, that's me!" Mm -hmm. But on the other side, holy moly! Right? There's mm -hmm. this there's this feeling of awe, and I. Really, I think that there might be no magic whatsoever in here. I think, except, yeah, except except, that was... except the except at the end, yeah, except at the end where um, he begins to uh, what's it called go through the mirror, right? Mm -hmm. Then, of course, the sword and sorcery returns. But right up until that point, I really feel like this whole setup was just. An existential crisis inside Cole's mind. Hmm. Well, that's probably a sign of an efficient wizard. You know, you use magic <laughs> when you actually have to, but apart from that, just rely on other methods. You know. Correct. I mean, it must be very tiresome, uh, especially as an elder gentleman of the elder race, uh, to do the magic. Hmm. Now, do you do you guys think that um, the wizard was trying to overthrow Cool, uh, or was Cool about to ascend into a higher plane of existence? Both, you know, I did... think. Yeah, both. He, he wanted Cool out of the way, and the easiest way to do that was to get shove him off into this higher plane of existence. So he opened the gateway to heaven, so to speak, for Cool. Hmm. All right, please enter, my king, and I'm and I'm gonna rule uh, here on earth. Then it gives me um, it gives me two impressions. Number one, this mirror world is not all it's cracked out to be, because why would the wizard not want to go into this higher plane of existence instead of ruling some measly kingdom? And number two, Cole, uh, Cole's longing for for this mirror world is part of a spell it's actually a curse so it's it seems to be like this forbidden fruit that's that once you consume uh, it will do something terrible to him or, or do you guys get a different impression oh like you said at the beginning cull is just a bit bored and and he needs a change <laughs> um, and this was a temptation a you know this was a temptation but the the wizard probably was of a lower, um, not lower intellect exactly, but he, he wasn't as ref mentally refined as Carl. He probably just a, um, cause that, this is now, this is really, really good. This is very memorable when Carl asks his friend, the Pict uh, about why, about the sorcerer's motivation. He said, but being a wizard, having knowledge of all the ages and despising gold, glory and position, what could Carnap offer Tuzan Thun that would make of him a foul traitor? Gold, power, and position, grunted Brule. The sooner you learn that men are men, whether wizard, king, or thrall, the better you will rule, Carl. So, you know, that's the, that to me was one if, of and I'm, Yeah, yeah, I mean, if we believe Brule, then you're right. But Brule is, although a great warrior... His intelligence is not on the same, you know, plane uh, plane level as Cole, right? Mm -hmm. And him, like he may be giving the simple wisdom that is the truth here, right? Or he may be misunderstanding the situation, and that's I think what the beauty of the story. A lot of these things, a lot of these. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. the I thought the story already hinted at what. Uh... 
the wizard's motivations might be. Uh, because he and the girl are of the elder race, uh, weren't they? And yes, he. It was hinted through the girl's motivations that they want to bring back the elder race to power, that they, re- perhaps resent, uh, Cole for, for taking over the the what used to be the elder races. I mean, it's not a. It's not a, shall we say, a um, a motive that is very intellectual or philosophical, but it is a very, uh, it's not banal. Believable. It's not banal, is what I'm it's trying to say. It's not banal, okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, lots of, lots of people, lots of different groups of people all over the world have had their homelands taken away from them by a late coming uh, invader and they want to take it back right. that's not a yeah like for example the mongolian hordes right when they when they rode out through the, or king alexander yeah uh, it's taking a, over middle east yeah it's yeah, not yeah. It's a, a tale as old as time it's not it is not a uh it's not a motive that is floating up here some uh, airy uh intellectual heights or anything like that but it is not a bano motive <laughs> Uh, while it not may be banal, I think I think what it does is it sets up a really interesting idea about the world. It gives you these breadcrumbs of world building about some. So they are part of this elder race. What it is, we don't know. And this, um, you've all, uh, all the both of you, you've watched like Quentin Tarantino movies, right? Like Pulp Fiction. No, I'm afraid not. Reservoir Dogs. Never heard of him. I've heard of him, but... Uh, okay, okay. I was about to say, you know, get underneath that rock, you know, and do something about your life. Um, yeah, no, really, uh, Robert, you should watch Pulp Fiction and you should watch Reservoir Dogs. I'll, I'll give you uh, the smallest of spoilers about Pulp Fiction, but that's your own fault. Um, there's a, the whole point of one of the storylines is these two gangsters, they're trying to get this suitcase for their boss. And inside the suitcase, whenever they open it in the movie, a golden light shines upon the faces of the people who see it. But the audience never see what's inside the briefcase. And thousands of um, mail have been sent to um, to Quentin Tarantino. He's been stopped on the street with almost guns pointed at his head. What's inside the briefcase? And his answer is, whatever you think is inside the briefcase, is inside the briefcase and what he loves about that is you know everybody has a different movie some people say it's gold some people say it's the soul of the boss right like some people go into like existential stuff some people say that inside this um this this place is a device or a weapon and so on and so forth and it's the same here with the elder race i fear it's a very tarantino-esque or i guess howard-esque because this was done first uh way of introducing world building and and making you ask questions i think it's answered later who the elder race is but i just love the fact that it's thrown at us and it's like viewer reader figure it out whatever the other race is you get to be the ruler of that uh story hmm yeah i could do with a, a few more bread breadcrumbs as i think you called them in this story specifically i'm just thinking now and this is t- uh, the whole king Cole saga i'd like to know more about atlantis because Howard uses the, the idea of Atlantis in a way which is not really familiar to me. To me, Atlantis, I suppose in science fiction, is sort of a, a very advanced land, you know, the, a super scientific maybe people who um, came to grief because they dabbled in bloody, bloody, blah, blah, which they shouldn't have been dabbling in, and the whole place blew up or sank. But uh, there doesn't seem to be that idea in in Cull. He's a barbarian, but that doesn't seem to go with being an Atlantean to me. Don't know if you have any thoughts on this. I mean, Atlanta. It is it is one of the big mysteries that other authors have tried to answer. 
in the world of Conan, what is Atlantis, right? And there's been prestiges where Atlantis is mentioned or the tale of Atlantis is sort of expanded on, but Howard himself never answered. And I mean, it is, it is you know, as you said, um, it's a very different, at least when it's described briefly, it's a very different land from the way I imagine Atlantis. Because even in uh, the tale of Atlantis by, um, was it Plato? No, who wrote about it? Was it Plato? Yeah, it was Plato in, in his... Ah, thank typical. God. I, mm. I'd feel like such an idiot being like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to name the guy and uh, mm. hope that it's the right one. No, no, okay, it's Plato. All right, good, good, good. I'm the smartest man. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so Plato uh, describes it as an advanced civilization that went into nothingness. Mm. Right, because of a because of a major cataclysm. But um, Robert going a different route, not Robert Gibson, Robert E. Howard, obviously. Um, it, it is it is fascinating, isn't it? Like um, I always like when something is subverted in in a genre. So, uh, for example, in my world, uh, there we go, self referential again. But in my world, uh, my fantasy world in Alcania, um, the the Orcish people. Uh, they come from the sea. They come from the underneath the waves, right? They're not uh, these uh, creatures that have been turned into something horrible, like in Lord of the Rings, right? Um, you know, they're their own people. They're still savage in some ways, um, but they, they have a very different aesthetic. Um, but mm -hmm. they still keep some of their um, orcish ways. And I think what could be cool, at least this is what I imagined um, when I was a child. Um, Recall the end of the Roman Empire. It kind of crumbled because of uh, barbarian hordes uh, that, that destroyed the land and scraped it clean. I imagined that Atlantis was highly advanced and then they, um, they sort of had a downfall because of their own hubris. And then a new race went in of these barbarians who took it over and they are the bar you know like they are the atlantean people that other people know so there was an atlantis but uh, the great flood is the second disaster not the first right right so it's more a a natural disaster then rather than brought about by the atlanteans themselves yeah 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 where um, where their downfall was brought up uh, was brought by them uh, to them Right, but it wasn't like an uh, some huge tidal wave. It's just a mm -hmm. a great mistake or a you know descend into madness because of the high technology they had or something like that. Because I would find that more interesting than them just mm -hmm. you know uh, boring too deep into the unknown and mm -hmm. the floods coming. Or in Plato's work, they angered the gods and the gods said, you know, bye, <laughs> and there mm -hmm. was no Atlantis. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Um another thing about the story, it talks about parallel worlds. It talks about multi-dimensions, that there are other cults, that there are other worlds where some of these things may be happening at the same time. And this is a very popular concept currently. Um, um you can see it basically whenever you see a trend in the Marvel movies, they become popular. So there was a very recently there was a movie um um, b uh, about Spider-Man and in that Spider-Man movie what they did was they got the actors from the other two Spider-Man franchises from long ago and they made them um, cross with the current actor so they all of their three worlds collided and they were working together right so there was this whole interdimensional story going on um, and, um, I think it's quite popular currently, right? This whole idea of multi-dimensionals. Mm. The, do you guys like that kind of uh, genre where there are many dimensions, many, uh, you know, like many heroes that are like the titular character and they cross, uh, with one another. Is that something that you find enjoyable? I, I imagine it must be very difficult to do in an interesting, well, in a profound way. Um, really, I I think the opposite. I think it's yeah. it's actually quite. In, it's a very good character study. Yeah. So 
so look i'll give you an example how i would do it um uh the slavans must play your story yeah uh where the child is uh stuck inside inside this horrible reality where people are turning 2d basically right um mm -hmm. you could do a, a cross-dimensional story where the other child in the Samus must play in a different universe that disaster was averted and they know how to save the other world right so something happens in the sequel where the two of them cross between one another right mm -hmm. and the child's like there's no time i'm gonna have to try and tell like i'm a kid myself right there's there's been some sort of a temporal flux where we have crossed between one another and the only person that could come is me because you're the only one alive in your reality so i as a kid am going to try to explain to you how to save your world and i'm going to do my best so you you have these two kids trying to both explain and understand right uh, this complex thing of how to save the world and the way you could make it very profound is uh, you could have the the character realize something about themselves and that's what saves the day because they're the same person and there are things that they both like they can be like oh i know the metaphor i need to use in order for him to understand it because that's the way i understood it right mm -hmm. there we go for yeah, example i see uh, yeah you convinced me actually it reminds me of uh I don't know if you know the writer Bob Shaw, one of the best British science fiction writers of last century, and he uh, he wrote a story called The Two Timers uh, about a, a man whose wife was murdered, and he discovers a way of going back in time uh, to kill the murderer before he does it. But the trouble is, he in doing so, he replicates himself. So now there are two of him. There's the rescuer him, and there's the original him and so he's he, you know he saved his wife but now he's got a rival namely his former self um so it, it works out the complications to do with that it's a great book i think the uh the reason for spider-man's from other dimensions crossing over is very simple i think it's just the fact that fans like fans of comics really love crossovers I think that's all mm. there is to it. They really like the fact that uh, it's like... So for the case of Spider-Man, I think it's just paying homage to 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 the various uh, Spider-Mans that were... that mm. that had been depicted through, through the ages. I think... I think it is just an excuse to do something that fans like and mm. it's it's is it, crossovers are a really really common thing in in the comic world um you have this uh, uh i think uh there's a very convoluted story uh story um series in dc with uh batman from the evil batmans oh um oh god bad metal i think it's called so, something you know the batman who laughs or, i i'm i'm a i'm a great uh fan of comics um and yes they do this interdimensional hopping all the time and um so the 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 really famous one is crisis on infinite earths yeah but uh, there's a bunch I mean, of superman a bunch of batmans a bunch yeah, of yeah i mean uh, i i think i think all it is 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 fans like uh um crossovers comic fans like crossovers <laughs> well the actually the crisis of infinite earth was created because the editorial in uh, dc were basically like we have like 50 continuities 60 comics all of these supermen are acting different we got to do something about it and yeah, yeah, their yeah. idea was we, that, were, we are going to that, connect well, this is where it began, right? Like, they, we're going to connect all of these tales and we're going to actually say, yes, all of these supermen are real. The one from the Golden Age is as real as the current one. And now there's a big crisis. They have to work together. Yeah. The, um, 
Price, prices <laughs> on Infinite Earth is a is a pruning is a pruning process. They are trying to trim down the amount of uh, bloat they have in their in their law. And yeah, and what they and what they did instead, by the way, is create sixteen other stories sure. which are about this convoluted I mean, uh, I, stuff. I, mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know uh, what came before or after, but the fact is, comic fans really love cl- crossovers. <laughs> um, the uh, the first ever crossover story was created because of toys by Mattel. Uh, so. Um, Marvel uh, got contract with the with the uh, with the toy f- uh, factory, and they were basically like, "Okay, here here are the uh, here are the superheroes that we want, uh, and uh, uh, you know, like we'll make uh, figurines of them, but you have to make a selling product for us." And Marvel was like, "You mean the comics, right?" And they were like, "No, th- th- there has to be like a tale about these heroes." And they were like, "All of them? Are you crazy?" And then they were like, "Well, you do it, or we go to DC." And they're like, "Okay, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Don't go to DC. Uh, we'll figure something out." And it was called the Secret Wars. And during the Secret Wars, um, all of these ongoing storylines, X Men, Spider Man, Fantastic Four, all of them were interrupted by a huge dome, this huge building appearing in the middle of New York. And all of the heroes mysteriously walking into it being like, we have to investigate. So they go inside, and then the first issue of the Secret Wars is, there is a group of villains and a group of heroes who have been selected for this battleground contest where they have to fight each other and prove once and for all, is good the stronger side or is evil the triumphant uh, side and mm. it's it's awesome it's a very awesome story that there's some you know titanic situations that get, goes on like for example this is the story where hulk literally holds up a mountain to save everybody else you know like not a, not a little rock like a literal mountain gets thrown at the heroes and uh, it's like issue three and then issue four has got this famous um cover of hulk holding the mountain as everyone else is like oh no <laughs> um and secret wars is where um the villain venom comes from the the spider suit the black spider suit it was created during Secret Wars, and then later the the black uh, suit became the um, the villain, well, right? I so mean, it's you know it's a whole it's a whole thing, but it all started as an advertisement for toys. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I, like I said, I don't know where it came about because I'm not so deep in. Well, I just told you now. You know, American comics. It could be what you say. It could be something else altogether. But the fact is, uh, comic fans really love the crossovers. Part of it, I think, is a lot of these comic uh, lines, they, they kind of sit in silos by themselves. And if you're a fan of both Hulk and Wolverine, maybe one of one, 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 uh, maybe there are times when you want to see them in the same uh, storyline, I suppose. But mm. it's, uh, it, may, it may be, as you say, I, 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 I don't know. Um, but... Uh, Going back to, going back to the uh, the multi-dimensional thing, I think it's uh, it's uh, for Marvel movies anyway. Fans just love uh, crossovers. Uh, but, also, uh, in uh, Star Star Trek, uh, the uh, Generations film, the old Captain that's right, the yeah. New one. Yeah. yeah yeah that's right they they, they mm-hmm. sort of uh, they have this whole device the the genesis uh, um uh what's it called yeah the the genesis program which is this huge uh thing that can change and terraform planets mm-hmm. and to make them livable right mm-hmm. um and Ta- captain kirk is stuck inside it um and uh, picard meets with them to fight the villain that's what i remember at least from the, I, from the movie. I remember the meeting. Uh, I don't remember the... Yeah, yeah, yeah he's it. like cooking eggs and stuff. He's like, yes, oh, yes, you yes, like yes, some yes, breakfast. Yes. <laughs> Picard is like, dude, <laughs> there's a guy who's trying to destroy the world. He's like, oh, mm. all right, get on the horse. <laughs> when they start going mm. for the villain. Good, good I remember shit. this crack in space. I don't remember what the meaning of it was, but I, was, I remember being really... 
really yeah quite... I, I, from what i recall the the super villain of the of the movie basically wanted to reverse the genesis effect and instead of creating planets uh like terraforming planets sorry uh to be livable he wanted to you know unalive the universe basically <laughs> right he was like mm -hmm. i'm done with all of you <laughs> Uh, one of these antisocial types. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Speaking. I mean, sometimes on speaking, a Friday evening, I also want to unalive the universe. Speaking Sorry, of uh, antisocial types, if we go back to our antisocial king, uh, mm -hmm. Kao, uh, I because we're coming up to an hour pretty soon. Do we have uh, any last words on the story? Hmm. I, I just my last word is uh, XJ. You were saying, was it? How does it compare with the other coal stories? I'd say it's it's very it's different. It's the odd one out among the coal stories, and it's the most memorable one to me, anyway. I'm not the other anything. ones, the other ones are very similar to. Co they're different because coal is the titular character, and is a you know he has a very different personality, but in tone, they are Conan like. Mm. 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 Yeah, so I would give it a. Uh, I would give the mirrors of Tuzan Thul a solid eight point five out of ten for both its contemplations and um, the uh, you know the setting. Um, the points that I'm taking off from it are because um, of the, you know. Of the fact that it is only six pages, I think he could have done a little bit more with the visions. Uh, there could there could be more of the story, and I think it it wouldn't. It's one of those. It's very rare when I say this, but um, I think more would be better actually. And uh, you know, like it's it's a punchy story, but it's punchiness is uh, actually its detriment. Because it asks such interesting questions and leaves them without exploration. Um, and, and I think that deters uh, from its score. Hmm. I would give it a 6.5 out of 10 for almost the exact same reason uh, that Nikki gave, which is that it's too short. Um, I was the the way the story started set a very different tone for me. Um, I was expecting something more along the lines of. So I don't know if there are uh, any such literature in the Western world, but in in Chinese literature we have a lot. We have a lot of very long sagas of kings and emperors and how they rule um, the uh, entire middle chunk and the last chunk of the romance of the three kingdoms is basically about kings and rulers um, how they relate to each other diplomacy and uh, management basically so very very high level management obviously but it's basically about that um, we also have uh, I don't know what the, what they call it in English, but Feng Shen Bang, uh, which is uh, which is a story of a king that is that is kind of sitting in the same space as Ku did in the starting of the story, who cares more about his own uh, uh, fulfillment than actually ruling the kingdom. And then a bunch of people, the king, the kingdom really went to shit. And then a bunch of people are trying to uh, come to grips with that and then revolting. And it, that is basically the story. So, uh, yeah, it, I, 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 I suppose I was a little bit disappointed that it didn't uh, go in that direction. I was hoping to see a bit more of that. And that's why it's 6.5. Over to you, Rob. Uh, I would give it eight out of ten, uh, which well, wow, uh, I gave it the highest uh, score. I did not expect. Yeah, it. sorry. Yeah. Mm, yeah, eight out well, of ten. So, so what? Why? Why are you two points off, not uh, one point five points off? 
Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I, I just <laughs> my subconscious comes up with these numbers, and I don't know yeah? what's what it's doing. I'm well, just... <laughs> I'm I'm glad to hear that there's no reasoning behind your numbers. I've I've suspected that for a very long time, but now that I have a confirmation from your own lips. Yeah. Well, reason is a is you know it, it has its place, but intuition <laughs> is, is is the key to everything. I think. Ah, intuition, yes, yes. Well, um, uh, well. Insight, instantaneous insights. Instantaneous uh, insights. Ah. Yeah. Well, uh, dear viewers, thank you very much for t uh, coming on this journey with us. Um, give a, give this story a read. It's short. It's available everywhere on the web. And it has a lot of interesting questions that it poses to, uh, to you that you yourself can use upon when you look into the mirror. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what a way to end. Anyway, yes, I agree. Uh, please like and subscribe and all of that. And have a good day. Goodbye.